far, but it, it got me thinking. Uh, recently, uh, old friends have called us from another state. And uh, she said, we, we listened. Uh, what, they weren't talking to me, I actually talked to my wife. We listen to Larry all the time, and, and my mother just loves Larry's sermons and listens to him all the time. So I think you need to hear that. <laughs> the reason I said is because the next week, uh, Betty passed away. So being selfish, it's like, oh Lord, I lost one more listener. I have, I have two left. <laughs> but uh, I say that because uh, they were from this area many years ago, uh, knew them and knew, knew Betty well back in those years, haven't seen her for a number of years. But I was thinking about that, and again, in my tenure as a, as a minister, I've done countless uh, memorial services and graveside services and things of that nature. And it, it reminded me of, of how we're to look at the world again in the fact that the macro view is that we live in a spiritual world that is just alive and maybe even more so than the world that we see. And as Christians, we're called to live by faith, which means living according to the world that you don't see, but that you know is true. And so we live in the hope of the gospel, the hope, the word hope not meaning wishful thinking, but a sure thing yet to come, that we live in the hope of the gospel, and that we live now in the power of it, and heaven to come. But if we look briefly at the invisible world, we get a kind of indication. The Bible indicates that when we die, we will not be alone, but that angels will accompany us on our journey to heaven. That's our destiny. Now, I wouldn't make a doctrine of that, that we all go to heaven and angels escort us there. But there is a wonderful story in the scriptures that Jesus tells. And in the telling of the story, he speaks of the one poor Lazarus who dies. And it says, the angels carried him to Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom in some translations which is another term for where Abraham resides is paradise but that when Lazarus died he was escorted by angels into heaven I like that thought it's certainly a biblical one I have no problem stating that to anybody who may be on the verge of passing away. And guess what? All of you are. All of you are. Our life is short. The Bible says with clarity that it is like the flower of the grass. One moment it's here, and the next moment it's gone. Now, I don't say that with any sense of morbidity or sorrow, but that we would live to the fullest for Christ. For to live is Christ and to die is gain. So that we would live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit residing in us if we're believers. If you're not a believer here this morning and you may not be, I'm glad that you're here. But God has called you here as Pastor Jason has said and God is speaking to you that you might be saved and have the assurance that other believers have. That when you pass from this life and go to the next that angels will escort you into heaven. The Bible also reminds us that we are never alone if we've given our lives to Jesus because God has come to live within us by the Holy Spirit and has adopted us into his family. One of Jesus' most comforting promises was spoken to his disciples just before he was taken back into heaven. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The Bible says in Romans that we never leave his presence. That there's nothing on heaven or on earth, created or whatever, that can separate you from the love of Christ. 
So that whatever transitions you make in this life and going in even to the next, you're never without or in the presence of Jesus. What a comfort that is to me. I hope it is to you. That as we live this life out, that we would give that hope to those who we are mentoring. Our children and our grandchildren. Those about us who we're called to minister to. Know the truth of the gospel. And know that we can tell the truth to those who don't know him. That they can be with Jesus all the time. And that God's love will never leave them. That he will never forsake them. But again, back to this point. We live in a spiritual world. And all the time the Bible tells us that we are amongst not just God's angels who are Given to us, the Bible says in Hebrews, as ministering spirits. But that we live among destructive angels. We live among principalities and powers in high places. Those terms are given to the hordes of angels that follow Satan. We read last week a story of a demonized man. I want to remind you that that story is a true one. And that we can look at it in the micro view of how demons act and how they seek to destroy humanity and make you more beastly. But before we get there, I want to just address yesterday's near assassination of once President Trump. I care where you stand politically, but not that much. I will tell you my point, why I'm a conservative, why I vote for men and or women who aren't pro-abortion and who are not pro the homosexual agenda. That's the current administration that we have. Extremely poor destruction of babies in the womb and extremely homosexually forward. I don't care what you think of Trump, really. I appreciate his policies, et cetera, et cetera, but that's not the point. Doesn't matter who our leaders are. That addressing any of them with violence is satanic. It's the unseen world that we need to see that, that really won't be talked about on the airwaves. That behind whoever does that is a demonic reality. Most likely demonized. If I can remind you in last week's message, in fact, let me read the passage to you out of Mark, that as Jesus had quieted the storm by his command, so they come to the shoreline and are greeted, if I can say using that word, by a demoniac, someone who's demonized. When they arrived at the other side of the lake, a demonized, or de it says here in this version, demon-possessed man. Let me remind you. In the Greek, we do not translate the one word, demon possessed. There's not two words in the Greek. There's one word that is best translated, demonized. Now, we can say he's in him. We can call it demon possession. But those aren't necessarily biblical terms. We have to be careful because we are so Hollywoodized that we look at many religious things and truths with a skewed perspective because Hollywood has given it to you. I wear a cross because when I deal with demonized people, I stick the cross out and it keeps them away. Not. That's Hollywood. The cross, the continued 
barking at this poor soul that's demon possessed to come out of him and, and all the stuff that goes with that is Hollywood. We don't see that so much in the scriptures. There is a scriptural verse or rather story where there are a group of brothers along with the father who seek to try to play Christ-like in regards to a man with a demon and the man who is demonized beats them all up and strips them and they all run away. But we don't get that from Jesus at all. When Jesus comes to this demonized man, it says that he ran out of the graveyard just as Jesus was climbing from the boat. This man lived among the gravestones and had such strength that whenever he was put into handcuffs and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the handcuffs from his wrists and smashed the shackles and walked away. No one was strong enough to control him. And all day long and through the night, he would wander among the tombs and in the wild hills, screaming and cutting himself with sharp pieces of stone. We can only imagine the fear that he raised in that community and how he alone kept everybody home at night. He was someone to be reckoned with because he was demonized. Now we know that there was a herd of pigs there. So without going into this whole story again, as the pigs were there, the, the demons had barked something out to Jesus. You remember what they said? Don't torture us, now is not the time. They were referring really to a time in the last day when they will be eternally tortured, so to speak. Where they will be thrown into the lake of fire with the evil one. They're most likely referring to that day. But when they come to Jesus, they don't come with some sense of, of power over him, but in fact bow to him. And then they essentially kind of do what Hollywood does now. We see Hollywood going, Come out of him! We adjure you in the name of Christ to come out of him! We hear that. We don't see that so much in the scriptures. But essentially that's what the demons do to Jesus when they come to him. They come, We adjure you in the name of God. To not torture us at this time. They kind of want to expel Jesus. They want to exercise Jesus. But they bow. Jesus, who's still far out in the water, when they see him and run to him, speaks, Come out, you evil spirit. It gave a terrible scream, shrieking, What are you going to do to me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? For God's sake, don't torture me. What is your name? Now, we know that this man probably had a dual personality by the nature of his sickness. So, he replies, Legion, for there are many of us here with this man. Now, for those of you who've ever studied ancient or Roman culture, a legion has shifted from at one time 8,000 men to 4,000 men. Probably a legion would be 6,000 men. So we know this. There was a lot of them. And again, as he's demonized, I'm not sure they were inside of him, but they were about him. And they were controlling his life. So let me, if I can, move for a moment again sideways to what happened yesterday. Most likely, the poor soul was demonized. I think anybody who does that at some point is extremely controlled by the evil one. Anybody who murders or does horrific crimes as such. Hitler was a demonized man. 
anybody like that is. But, and there's, by the way, a lot of evidence that backs, but I'm not teaching on that per se, so I'm not going to go into that, and I have before, where his background, there was a lot of spiritual input into his life. But let me just say this, that you can be demonized even as an institution. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Is that you can have an institution that does very evil things, but people within it are like you and me. They don't get the big picture. They don't see all that's going on, and they're doing what they do. But the institution in itself is doing things that are very evil to people. Because institutions can be demonized in that regard. The demons can overtake those within leadership and governments and and move nations. And there's a lot of evidence to that too in regards to just in the Bible how we see, again, the movement of evil entities within evil nations who did evil things, who worshipped demons, the Bible says. They worship other gods who aren't gods at all, but in fact are demons, Paul says. So when we find what happens yesterday, it's appropriate for us to pray. Because I, because I think that our country is all the more moving towards an institution that's being driven by evil spirits. And I don't know how all that works out. It's complicated. I can only tell you what I think in that regard. But as we move more and more towards what I would call evil legislations, the more we see the hand of evil that is actually within the institution, even though there are good people within it. Wherever your heart is, is your Lord. There is no individual here who is Lord of their own lives. There is something that you find more important than anything, and that's your Lord. Some of you have to look deeply because your Lord is hiding and you don't tell the truth. If Christ is your Lord, then I'm inviting you to see the whole world through the lens of the Scriptures. That you would have a worldview that is driven by truth. That Jesus is your Lord. That you do what you do because He's your Lord. What's another word for Lord? Master. Boss. CEO. Put in whatever term you want. The one that rules your life is where your heart is. So if you want to know who rules your life... Find where your heart is. What do you give all your time to? What do you give all your energy to? That's your Lord. May it be to the things of God. May it be to Christ. Let me move to Mark chapter 1 and chapter 4 to read a few things to you to get some more insight into this idea of demonization or the evil one or the unseen world. In Mark 1, 29 through 34, it tells us that Jesus heals many. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by, say it with me, demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew 
him. Now, this is the power of Christ. Now, let me give you another verse. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I don't teach the portions of Scripture regarding demons very much, but when I do, it's not to instill fear in you, but confidence in Christ in you. The confidence in Christ in you in you is to do what Jesus did. Jesus said, I will bring another, I will send another, he will be like me, and he will be with you, and he will be in you. The Holy Spirit. To do even greater things than I, Jesus said. Not because we're greater than Jesus, but because he's given us his power, his divine power in us. And we're called to live by faith and not by fear. We live in a fearful world. And all of us have got to navigate and fight the fear that wants to oppress you. We'll get to it in just a little bit. But the Bible speaks in terms that it recognizes that humans are entangled with various sicknesses that affect various parts of us. We'll get there in just a minute. And I'll try to clarify that to you. But before I get there, let me read in Luke 4, 38 through 41. And he arose, that is Jesus, and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. This is Luke, by the way, I'm sorry, Luke 4. Which is again referring the same message here. About Simon's mother-in-law being ill with a high fever They appealed to him on her behalf, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now, I don't understand that. One reason I want to read that is because when he rebuked the fever, I I don't quite get that. I, I go, thank you, Lord, that you do that, that you can expel sickness from a body. But I don't quite understand that. Most people I pray for, as much as I believe that God can do it, generally stay sick for a while. So I find myself praying like this, Lord, bring healing to my brother, to my sister. But Lord, (laughs) here's the, but Lord, while they remain ill, may they learn all the lessons you want them to learn. I'm thinking, is that a good prayer? I'm not rebuking much of anything. And sometimes I don't know what to pray. Sometimes I think the Lord wants you to stay sick for a while. Does the Lord ever want you to remain in the sickness for a while? Does he? The answer is yes. The one shining example is the Apostle Paul, who has an infirmity. And he says, I prayed it three times, Lord, take this from me. And he said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Sometimes in our sickness, we learn something greater than if we're well. And God is more concerned with your heart than he is with your body. Not that he's not concerned with your body. Not that your body isn't important because it is. That's why one day you'll get a new one. That's what everybody should say. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One day you'll get a new one. Because God thinks that's important for humans to have. Why? Ask me why. I don't know. (laughs) Ask any more dumb questions, you're going to get that same answer. (laughs) No. I I mean, uh, you know, God is our creator, and He's created us, you know, with, with a body in paradise, not to be in sickness. I, I do know something about it. I don't mean to just say, I don't know. I just know that he created us in the wholeness of the human whose flesh and blood and bone and brain and lung without sin, perfect. But we live in this condition because of sin. And so... The body in our original creation is still important to God. That's how he made us in the unique creatures that he made us, in his image. But sin is now brought to us, ultimately, death. 
And when the Bible speaks about healing, as it speaks about it here, all healings except for the demonic ones, all healings are what? Temporary. Temporary. As I've said many times, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Remember that? John chapter 11. He raises La- Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb and he's, he's bound up in, in grave cloths. And they go, uh, release him from the grave cloths. And he's like, ah, okay. Hang on, Lazarus, you're going to die again probably in another few years. It was only temporary because God is revealing through Jesus the Son the reality of who God is, that he's more powerful than disease and death. But it won't come until all death and disease and Satan is vanquished. And until then, we have a battle. We're in a war. For we do not battle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers in high places. So when something happens like yesterday, that we would go, the devil is prowling about. He's prowling about. I, I read, a, again, I, I can't testify to Trump's spirituality or you know, he claims to be a Christian. I, I, I don't know him. I just know what the media says about him. And this part wants to say all the bad part. This part says all the good parts. I, I like his policies. But I just read from uh, one of our band members, uh, you know, his official statement. And, and his statement is, again, you know, against evil, but also asking for prayers and that, that, you know, God is in all of this and, and, and God essentially saved him and now pray for our country. But here's the deal is that uh, from my knowledge and I was, I don't watch news as you know, most of you, I don't watch TV news so much. I think it's very cited, but I did this morning and they said that he just happened to be speaking when he turned to the right and as he turned by the right, the bullet pierced his ear. And if he had turned to the right, it would have, we would be talking about something else. That's what they're saying is a miracle. That God is in that. Now, I don't know the hand of God in everything, but I know that, that God is everywhere. And, and God, God isn't overtaken by evil, and, and God will preserve who he needs and will, is willing to preserve. Our point of view is that as we see the world unfold, good and bad alike, is that we see also an invisible world. Back to the point. We live in a world, macro, where the evil one is moving about his forces in such a way to destroy God's body, God's church, God's people, God's human Not just the church, but that specifically because it stands in the way of his work. But he wants to make you and I more, I'll say it again, beastly. The the further we get from God, the more beastly we become. And when you see sin take its toll, you find they become more animalistic. They become less moored or less anchored to morality or to the things that God is. And they're now tethered to their own desires. So that I'm my most natural full self when I'm who I want to be. Which is, I'm God. And what's going to rule my life is my desires. Whatever they are. We're moving more and more to that world. And the other ugly part of our world is that we now are creating in the soul of a nation or in people a desire for safety more than freedom. How do you get to be more safe? Bigger government. The bigger the government, the less the freedom. 
People don't want freedom, they want safety, so they make government bigger. Without going into all of that, there's not a political message. Is that we live in a spiritual world that is moving forward to destroy humanity. There is a pattern to evil, and the pattern to evil is to make men less like men. In Matthew 4, the Bible says to us, Then Jesus was led out of the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted there by Satan. For 40 days and 40 nights he ate nothing and became very hungry. Then Satan tempted him to get food by changing stones into loaves of bread. It will prove you are the Son of God, he said. But Jesus told him, no. For the scriptures tell us that bread won't feed men's souls. Obedience to every word of God is what we need. Here's the temptation. Okay, you know who you are. Others apparently think they know who you are. Prove to me that this is who you are. What is Satan doing? He's trying to take out in Jesus something connected to pride. He's trying to say, Jesus, it must be important to you that you prove to me what you say is true. Jesus is essentially this, I don't answer to you, I answer to the Father. Now, how, much, how many of us are caught up in that kind of world where, where somebody says essentially to us, oh, prove it. And we kind of go, okay. In all kinds of ways, life says, oh, yeah, prove it. And we get prideful. and we are, We're always having to fight pride. I still fight pride. 71 years old, I'm fighting the same stupid pride. The ones that tell me, prove yourself to so-and-so or to so-and-so. Let them know how educated you are. Let them know how much experience you have. Let them know how much and fill in the blank. Because they don't really know you, but they need to know you. Because somewhere deep inside of us, or deep inside of me, I need man's approval I have to fight that I have to fight loving you and telling you at the same time but what you think of me means very little I love you Joe but what you think of me doesn't matter that much I'm going to love you anyway I love you this much honey And what you think of me doesn't really matter all that much. But I will love you this much. From here to the moon. But what you think of me doesn't matter that much. What really matters is what God thinks of me. And He loves me from here beyond the moon. So you know what that means? It means I can love you. Why? Because I have a full tank. I have a full tank. I'm so loved by God, I can love you, and I don't have to prove to you that I'm somebody important, that I'm somebody valuable, that I'm somebody with meaning, that I'm somebody that, I, I, you, know, that, that you should bow to me for. Hogwash. I'm loved by God. And then I'm going I'm to keep working at in the flawed way that I do to love you. All of us fall short. But if we belong to Jesus, then we are fully loved. By His grace we've been saved. And we have a blessed hope. And the divine nature of God, in Peter tells us, resides in us. But Satan even goes to Jesus and says, again, this is the evil world. 
We're seeing it out front here in, 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 in what's recorded for us in the Word of God, but it's a microcosm of how Satan works. That's the point. That he wants to tempt us. Maybe it's not Satan himself like here with Jesus, but his demons want to tempt us just the same to say, you know, whatever you want, I'll give to you. And he'll, he will. He'll give it to you. But it's going to cost you a lot and you're going to be enslaved for it. Jesus came to set you free. And Satan is here to make you a slave to him. And to the desires of the world and not the Lord. So then Satan took him up into Jerusalem and up on the roof of the temple. And he said, jump off, he said, and prove you are the Son of God. He keeps saying the same thing, prove it. Prove it, Jesus. And you see, the world's going to be like that to you. It's going to be, prove it. Prove you're a man. Prove you're a woman. Prove it. The Bible says, live before God and work out the good deeds that He's prepared for you to do before you were born. Go do good for the sake of Christ. Stop trying to prove yourself that satanic Satan works in various ways and I don't tend to know them all but I can tell you what the Bible says. And the Bible says that he's looking to trap you. The Bible tells us in Timothy, in 1 Timothy, it tells us that, that pride entraps you. Pride is the devil's trap. He works in all kinds of ways to enslave us to something other than God. Jesus responded, it, is all, it also says to put the Lord your God, to put the Lord your God to a test is foolish. Next Satan took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him the nations of the world and all their glory. I'll give it all to you if you just kneel and let me be your Lord. I'll give you whatever you want. I'll give you the best of the world if you just worship me. We don't like the word worship because that's like, nah, I wouldn't do that. But I'll just give you the best. I'll, I'll give you meaning and purpose. I'll give you value in men's eyes. You know, we like that. We like that. You know, I was in, as you, many of you know, maybe you don't, I'll, I'll briefly say, I was ordained in 1979, that's when I came out of graduate school. And all, and I have a counseling degree, but all, all my life I've been doing ministry, but within it, God's given me some, some other task, along with pastoring the church, as I pastored the church, I was the executive director of a YMCA. For 14 years while I pastored this church. And then I left for five years, I, when I left there for five years, I was chief of staff for a politician while I pastored this church. And here's what I learned about politics. When you spend time with politicians, they're talking to you like this. Hey, it's good to see you. I'm so glad that you're here. I really am glad that you're here. Oh, excuse me. And they go to somebody who's more important. They're always looking at you, but they're looking beyond you. They're looking for whoever it is that they need to talk to. And that's an ongoing thing in politics. Because what's really important, and not, there's always exceptions. Not everybody is like bad in politics. I'm not saying that. There's good people in politics. But most of them <laughs> are looking at you, but looking somewhere else. For somebody else more important. Somebody else a little bit, have a little bit more money to the campaign. A little bit more money, a little bit more this, a little bit more power. They're always looking beyond you. They want the approval of men. How do I get into office? By your approval. If I'm not careful, I'll turn it around. I won't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be approved by God. If you like that, hire me. If you don't, don't. But we, we say that, but then we find ourselves sometimes really looking for your approval. It's a hard business because Satan is there. 
The evil one is there. Why? Because that's where power resides. And that's where you can move many souls to evil. Again, because demonization isn't just an individual. Sometimes it's environments. It's movements. It's Nazism. It's certain kinds of communisms. Get out of here, Satan, in verse 10, Jesus told him. The scriptures say, worship only the Lord God, obey him only. Then Satan went away, and the angels came and cared for Jesus. You will be cared for always. As the Bible tells us in Hebrews, that angels are ministering spirits who came to minister to God's creation. That's you. As we come to time being an issue, I want to read you this to kind of clarify something regarding demonization and mental illness. Life is complex, and you're complex. You're all complex. We like to categorize you with little one-liners. And we like to group, group you all, but, but we're all very complex. And, and we're uh, body, soul, and spirit. And, and we, we segregate that, but in, in the Greek language and even in the Hebrew, those are harder sometimes to separate, and it's more of a wholeness. But we, we separate them, especially in the sciences, because as we separate those things, we can make more money off if we just deal with your soul, or with your body, or with your spirit, or with your, and we can label you, and we, once we label you, we can go like this, oh, you've got this, you're bipolar. And then we, we can shovel all kinds of money into that, and you, we can label you, whatever. I'm not picking on anybody who's, Bipolar. I'm just saying that there's all kinds of labels for whatever your sickness may be, psych- psychologically or physically. But in the Bible, we find that, that that's not quite as easily done But we're because we're complex. And we rarely ever hear about the spirit or the spiritual part of us or the absence of the spirit as to why we're so sick. By the way, I did hear, as I was listening to the news, it was on Fox News. I don't know who the guy is because I don't listen to it anymore. But, but uh, the guy was talking about what happened yesterday. And then at the end he goes, you know, but I'm just going to invite you all. Go to church today and go pray. I said, oh, praise God. Somebody said go to church on TV. A host. Okay. Let me read to you. Uh, to Matthew to, to try to give you a sense of the complexity of us as humans, but that the Bible recognizes it. The Bible isn't silent about it. And it's the only religion of, I, I don't like talking about, about it like that because it seems like it's like one of many religions. Are all, Christianity is the only true religion. Not because I say that, because the Bible says that. That there's no other way to heaven but through Christ the Son. That's it. There's no room for anything else. And a lot of other religions religions say, oh, we don't believe in that. We just believe Jesus was a good guy. And as you know the story, Jesus can't be a good guy if you believe he really was because he said he was the only way. And your way, if it's not his way, is not a way. And he did other things that you would either have to say he's crazy or he's a liar. Jesus didn't give you an option for him. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. That's what Jesus said. Okay. The Bible is the only faith or religion that really treats spiritual life and soulish life in what we really see to be real in the world. 
It treats it in the reality of our complexity and understands it and addresses it. In every other religion, by the way, or cult, you expel demons with hocus-pocus stuff. There's all kinds of stuff on expelling demons in Egyptian ancient writings and texts. All kinds of things in history on how you can expel evil spirits. They're all calling on some, something over and beyond them to do this kind of work through hocus pocus stuff. Only Jesus said, come out. And they came out. What's your name? Be quiet. Go to the pigs. There was no hocus pocus. There was no, I've, wait, I've got I've to talk to the Father about this. It was Jesus in his power to say, come out of him. Go into the pigs. Pigs go into the sea. The power of Christ is unique in all the world ever. Nothing, nobody like him. And this is the Christ we serve who will fill you with his Holy Spirit. In Matthew 4, 24, there is a list of the infirmed with a clear distinction between the demon-possessed and those that are crazy. Jesus now moved about through the whole of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news about the kingdom and healing every disease and disability among the people. Everything. His reputation spread throughout Syria and people brought to him all those who were ill, suffering from all kinds of diseases and pains. I like that because it separates that. And in the Greek it does that, it separates that. There are certain sicknesses that, that are, are diseases and certain things that are just pains. Like what? Like my arthritis in my right knee. Whatever it was, they brought it and Jesus healed it. All the people brought to him, all those who were ill, suffering from all kinds of diseases and pains, including the devil possessed, again, not a good translation, demonized people, and insane people. Now, I don't know if I gave the Greek or the Latin up there, but selenizomai, is that up there? It is a, a word for, um, for the insane. We, we get our, our Latin word lunaticas, which is another way of saying moonstruck. Now we say that in a loving way. I said, honey, I'm just moonstruck when I see you. I mean, it's kind of a loving thing, romantic thing. I like the old movie, Moonstruck. When Cher was a woman, was she a woman? Anyway, but I like the movie Moonstruck. But really it meant in the old ancient days is that people's mental illnesses were moved by the moon's gravitational pull. And as the seas were moved, so were their brain matter. And we get the word lunatic from that. The crazies. Now, we have a little more compassion for that. We don't like to say the crazies. We like to say those who have mental issues or mental problems. And let me say this to all of you, as I've said before. We're all born in sin, and all of us are diminished in every capacity. And you all have some sort of mental illness. Some of you, Joe, worse than others. But nonetheless, you know, we have, all of us, mental flaws and mental brokenness. Some of you work harder at not being depressed. Some of you work harder at not being, you know, frantic and up and, and out. We call it now bipolar, but the fact sometimes somebody, well, when you have it both, 
when you do both. It's called bipolar, way up, way down. And then some people are always fighting, you know, sadness. Some people are always fighting anxiety. Some people are always fighting fill in the blank. Our propensity to be addicted, our propensity to, to be stuck, our propensity to be enslaved by this or by that, our propensity to, to do things over and over, our ticks, our things. We all have stuff. But some are more debilitating than others. So I don't, I don't want to make light of that. That there are some of you here who have mental brokenness that is more debilitating than others. It keeps you out of the group. It keeps you isolated. It keeps you out of another kind of health. And any time our debilitations create greater unhealthiness, we really want to work with Christ to be healed and to find health. So when the Bible says that all who came to him suffering from all kinds of diseases and pains, including the devil possessed and the insane and the paralyzed. The Bible makes a distinction. Now here's the deal. We can't always make a distinction. Is that person bipolar, schizophrenic, or demon possessed? Is that person bipolar, schizophrenic, or demon possessed? Well, we don't always know. Sometimes it seems evident. Sometimes it doesn't. But we want to minister to the whole person. And we cannot minister to any part of a person without ministering to the spiritual. If it's physiological, like a depression, then they need rest and medication and nutrition. If it's moral, if their depression is morally instigated, they need the remedy for guilt and shame. They need confession and forgiveness. They need grace. If it's mental or psychological, they're cast down and extremely discouraged. They need love and support. They need community. If it's spiritual or demonic, they need prayer and the word of God and the power of other believers about them. We are complex and we fight a battle that is both a battle from without and a battle from within. But we can address it all as believers because we see the whole person. I'm not ready to go call people de demonized. But I'm more apt to say demonized in the sense that they don't have to be possessed. But there's demons that in fact are controlling them and moving them in ways where they're enslaved to ill habits and diseases and functionality. And God is there to bring healing to you if you're here and you feel stuck. Some of you are so stuck and maybe you're not here, maybe you're there, but you're so stuck that you're demonized and we have to, in essence, say demons come out and leave. But we're all fighting the battle of a demonic world that wants to make you more beastly. So the Bible tells us in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let everyone come to know your gentleness. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and specific prayer, with gratitude, make your request known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will protect your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's calling you to relationship with the living God, who hears your prayers, both the general and the supplication, which is the specific. And God meets you in your prayers, and he'll give you rest and peace that surpasses human understanding. That's what God does. But come not doubting, but knowing that this is the God we serve. 
goes on to speak to us in Philippians. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and there's any praise, think on these things. Put your mind in the things of God. Don't let your minds go wherever the world wants to take you. Be mindful about where you put your mind. Take in the things that are of God. Let me close with Paul's final instructions. There's a lot more to say here that I'm not going to go into, but keep playing, Luke, but I have a couple of things to say. I just have to say this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Now just for a moment, back up from those two scriptures. In modern war, there are political objectives social political dynamics a heavy use of propaganda a physical military force to subject the enemy to our will the focused exertion of power includes land air and water assaults on the back end and continuing use of cyber warfare that's my thoughts of current war we're called not to fight like that We're not called to make them subject, the enemy subject themselves to us. That is never our objective. Our objective is always to give the gospel. To give salvation to those who want it. Let me close with this thought. When Jesus met with the demoniac, the demonized man, and the demon man tried to expel Jesus essentially Jesus took the place of that man you see that man was healed and at the end of that story that real story real life story Jesus and that man had a relationship the man wanted to go with Jesus Jesus says no stay here and tell your story because he Eventually, Jesus will be the naked one. Jesus will be the one who will be oppressed. Jesus is the one who will be stripped naked and beat and bloodied to almost death until they kill him and they'll send him to the tomb. That's what Jesus did for him, and that's what he does for us. We don't fight the war like our world fights a war. We fight it in the power of the cross, in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus. May you go out in that power and figure out what it means to minister to the person right in front of you not looking for somebody more important or powerful to come your way, but the person right in front of you. How do you minister to them the cross and grace of Jesus? That's how we fight the evil one. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please rise. The band's going to The band's going to do a uh, a new song for some of you, an older one uh, for those of you who know it. But in the middle of the song, there's a a, a, a line, a couple lines. Uh, Luke, can you read it? Read it um, to to me, or oh, here it is. Thanks. I don't know this song. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The song is called Honor Christ the King. There are people captive and able to fight, 
held in prison black as midnight. And he sets the captive free. He sets the captive to flight. And he strikes the night with the light. And then this verse 2. Speaking about end times. And not to be afraid. It says, frozen by the roar of the lion. Fallen by the rage of the bear. Which are other countries, other entities. And shaken by the breath of the beast. The antichrist who will come. But we're hidden in the breast of the King. And we know the strength of being in Christ. Whatever happens about us, 